Dan, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Welcome to the Bodies Built Better podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Looking forward to it. Oh man, I am so pumped because stretching and flexibility, as I've said before, is one of my favourite subjects. And I think, well, I feel like there's so much misinformation out there. And so I'm really looking forward to, uh, well, you clearing some stuff up for us. So let's dive straight in. I'll do my best. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Well, let's start with, you know, how your journey began and how you came to be a flexibility researcher. Yes. So my journey first started when I was about four or five years old, Um, started out training in martial arts um, in mostly karate, taekwondo. So all of the styles that required flexibility. And I was very lucky because I had instructors who were very well educated in things like anatomy, physiology, physical education. Um, so very early on, I was I was being taught about the science of uh, stretching or what the science we knew about the science at that time. Um, and then that progressed to training with people like Thomas Kurz, the author of Stretching Scientifically. This was kind of early to mid 90s. And he was a huge influence on me, you know, like talking about the, the science of stretching and flexibility. Um, and then I, I started to take that understanding of the science and embed that in my own karate lessons so my my very first paid job was actually teaching dedicated flexibility classes at my karate school um i think i was paid the equivalent of like 30 cents an hour or something this is like <laughs> like late 90s and i was like i think 14 15 at the time i was technically my, my first paid job um but that was the same time as uh the internet was really taking off so not only was i teaching this stuff in person i was also uh, teaching people about flexibility in uh, via email, message boards, chat rooms, which were all the rage in the late 90s. Um, this was before obviously Facebook and Messenger and all these kind of things. Um, and I, I wanted to take my understanding of the science much deeper. So I went to university, I got my uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in kinesiology. I, I did actually head down the track of becoming a doctor of physical therapy. Uh, but there was so much that was being taught on the course that didn't align with what I was finding for myself in the research. So I, I decided to stick with the masters and then, and then go off on my own. Um, and like I say, there was such a, a massive gap between what was being said, not only at university, but also in sports teams and physiotherapy clinics and what is actually being said in the, in the scientific literature. Um, So I ended up getting a job as a peer reviewer. Um, And for people who aren't sure about what peer reviewers are, anytime a research team submits a paper to a journal for publication, it goes through the peer review process. So these are people who know a thing or two about the subject and then look for uh, the quality of the methodology and the strength of the conclusions and things like that. And what I was finding is a lot of the papers being submitted to journals were failing to answer the so what question. So you get a paper and the the methodology was great. The uh, statistical analysis was fantastic, but it was pointless. Like there was one, I remember one uh, paper which examined the difference between stretching for five seconds and stretching for 10 seconds. And it was like, well, we know from previous research that stretching for less than 30 seconds isn't really that effective. So what was the point? Exactly. Um, yeah. Wow. But then with these with these papers that were getting rejected because they were quite big names attached to the to the research team the editors would step in and overrule the the peer review process and publish anyway so at that time it was very political very money driven it's a lot better now um but i I kind of moved away from that and decided uh to just go around uh working one-to-one with uh, professional dance companies uh sports medicine clinics and also lecturing at universities and saying, okay, this is what the research actually says. And this is what people in the industry are saying. And just trying to close that gap between, between the two fields. And that's kind of what I've been doing for the last, most of the last decade, really. Um, but like you said, there's so many misconceptions. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the people doing the research don't know a lot about the practicalities of stretching and flexibility as well. So uh, it's, it's quite a frustrating place to be. 
Um, yeah, so that's that's my journey in a nutshell. Basically, started as a martial artist, went to college, did peer review for a bit, didn't enjoy it. So now I I independently critically appraise the research, and I, I do advise research teams as well. We got like different research labs and clinics, and they they will send me proposals and say, "What do you think about this?" <laughs> I'll give it the stamp of approval. Like, <laughs> well, yeah, that's really great. I was gonna say, like, yeah. what's the point of the research is if there's the research isn't good to begin with <laughs> mm. like it's pointless yeah. stuff like you said exactly yeah and that's that's the i think that's where a lot of misconceptions come from because there's a very strong anti-stretching bias in the health and fitness industry it's i, I think it, it goes around in circles you know it's it'll be stretching now it'll be something else in a year's time then something else and then we'll come back to stretching in five years but people will cherry pick those uh, those poor studies and say, here is the evidence to support my claim. It's like, well, hang on a second. That's not the only study, right? And let's look at the exactly. study itself. And it's, it's really not that great. Um, and, and hopefully we'll talk about that a little bit later in the conversation. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's give you the broadest question of all. Mm -hmm. Why is stretching important? Mm. Yeah. So whenever there's questions like this, I always say we have to ask other questions. Yeah. Um, you know, people say, why is stretching important? Well, what type of stretching are we talking about? Because there are different types of stretching. And I'm, you know, I'm sure we'll, we'll cover that uh, a little later on. But when we think about what stretching is, it's really any activity that takes the joints to their, to and beyond their limits of range of motion. And in doing that, we take the tissues to and beyond their limits of extensibility. So we're literally stretching the tissue. So whether you are holding a stationary position, whether you're moving your joints, those tissues are being stretched, right? And this has um, implications for joint health and longevity because something the research is unequivocal on is that as we get older, we lose range of motion. And there are certain physiological reasons associated with senescence. Senescence is just the process of biological aging. Um, and, you know, it makes tissues thicker, uh, makes tissues stiffer, more dehydrated. And that does have an effect on tissue extensibility and ultimately joint range of motion. But the main reason why joint health gets worse as we age, we lose range of motion, we fall over is simply because we don't take those joints through their full ranges of motion. We don't use them. It's our old adage, use it or lose it, mm. right? So when we're not you know, taking our joints through their full ranges of motion uh, and therefore stretching the tissues. Uh, we're not making any significant changes to um, tissue stiffness. And so we're not trying to offset that age related change in tissue stiffness. We're not providing the joints with all of the nutrients that they need. And so we start to see the development of these pathologies in and around the joints, you know, like deposits of calcium and, and fibrotic tissue starting to develop. And also, when we're not using the joints to their fullest capability, the cortical map within the brain, which is the, the representation of that joint and its capabilities inside the brain, kind of gets smudged. I think that's one of the best words I can use to describe it. And so things like proprioception and balance get negatively affected. And so we start to see this increased risk of uh, falls and loss of balance. So by taking the joints through their full ranges of motion and therefore stretching the tissues regularly, um, and ideally with a certain amount of load as well, which is great for things like joint health. Uh, it's just good for overall health and longevity. And that's before we even get to things like performance, right? You know, certain people have to stretch because their performance depends upon it. Mm. But I think just for having a, a, keeping your body in good working order, you need to move your body. And, you know, a lot of people don't like calling that stretching. You know, if, if, you, uh, if you do leg swings, for example, you're stretching some tissues. It's you can't get around that. There is a stretch involved in every movement. You don't want to call it stretching. Don't call it stretching. But you need to move your joints and use your body in order to maintain it and keep it in good, uh, good working order for as long as you can. Um, that's the main reason, I think. Yeah. But like I said, you know, certain aspects of performance do depend upon it as well. Awesome. Well, let's get to performance because okay. the, the research that I commonly hear about or get told about from athletes is that um, it has a negative impact on performance and on recovery or 
thereabouts. So what is the research that you found? Um, and yeah, is there a problem with that research or that message? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you, you raise a really interesting point there. You know, people will come, like an athlete will come to you and say, this research says this, so therefore it must be bad for me without thinking, well, what does it actually do for you? You know, forget the research for a second. How does stretching make you feel? How does it make you perform? So I think something people need to do is maybe not depend upon the research as much. The research is very good at informing us of the directions we should be heading in and explaining the why behind certain things work and maybe don't work and also helping to fight against a lot of the misinformation that's out there you know there's, there's a lot of claims being put out there that just are not biologically plausible there's no evidence for it so that's what the research is good for but your training and the things you do in training should be informed by what you're trying to achieve and how your body responds to them uh so that was just a point i wanted to to raise there but when people say you know the research shows stretching doesn't help recovery performance very often they're presenting a very loaded statement that leans towards their biases, which is very often against stretching. And the thing with statements like that, you know, uh, stretching doesn't do this, is again, you need, to, you need nuance. And we get nuance by asking questions like, well, what type of stretching are you referring to? What exactly do you mean by recovery? What do you mean by performance? So if we take recovery, um, if by recovery we mean a reduction in delayed onset muscle soreness, then uh, I think it was 2011 or 2012, there was a meta-analysis done. So meta-analysis is like the highest level of research we can get or the highest quality evidence we can get where they, it's usually a systematic review and a meta-analysis. So a systematic review is where they gather up all of the applicable uh, studies, review them for quality, and then the meta-analysis looks for trends within those, within those studies. So that's how we get the trends across the research. And this meta-analysis had like 2000 test subjects and they found that stretching before and after physical activity helped to reduce delayed onset muscle soreness. But whether or not stretching is going to help with delayed onset muscle soreness depends very much upon the person and what that person is doing. So for example, say you were stretching and you got delayed onset muscle soreness from stretching, then it doesn't make sense to expect that doing more of the thing that caused the soreness in the first place is going to alleviate the soreness. It's like doing bicep curls getting sore biceps and then doing more bicep curls to to alleviate the soreness all you're, all you're really doing in that sense is dumping more tensile stress on tissues that were mechanically and chemically damaged by tensile stress but at the same time some people do feel better when they do light stretching when their muscles are sore so my advice to people always is experiment and find the combination of things that work best for you um, but the research should, does show that stretching can help with muscle soreness in many cases it doesn't um, and that's because of how the tissues were damaged if by recovery we mean recovery from injury then stretching is absolutely going to help because one of the first thing that that happens following an injury is there's a reduction in range of motion and stretching is definitely going to help with that if there's one consistent truth we found with the research is that stretching improves range of motion right and, and you ask any physical therapist or chiropractor following an injury what is the main thing we try to do first after obviously controlling swelling and pain all that kind of thing improve range of motion right or restore range of motion so that's recovery when it comes to performance again it, it very much depends upon the type of stretching you're doing and the nature of performance so if you need to display positions or movements in your workout or in your sport and you need to stretch to do that, then stretching is, is going to help. For example, um, I, you know, I had a client who, no matter how much we tried to progress his range of motion with, with this, in the squat with the bar on his back, he had to pre-stretch um, by doing like frog stretch, butterfly stretch, and all these kind of groin and high hamstring stretches in order to get the range of motion he wanted in that squat. Uh, so someone like that, that's a very tailored approach to stretching. Um, and so stretching in the warm up worked for him. If you are, let's take a sport like Taekwondo, right? So it's martial art that rewards points based upon being able to kick people in the head. And if, if you kick your opponent in the head more times than they kick you in the head, you score more points and you win. Therefore you've had a better performance, right? But 
to be able to get those high kicks, you're going to need to be able to do the splits or at least get very close to the splits. Um, and so stretching in the splits is going to help for that. Where you put that stretching in a workout depends upon your level of development. If you can't yet do the splits and you need to do those kicks, you probably put the splits in the, in the warm up. Once you have the splits quite easily and you have very good dynamic flexibility, move the, move the split stretches to the end of the workout just to save time, if anything. Um, I mean, we do get some people saying, uh, I can kick people on the head and I, and I can't do anything close to the splits. There was a very popular, I won't name any names, but there's a very popular Muay Thai coach who said this quite recently. But again, you need to dive down into what these people are saying. And when you look at, at this, this particular individual, it's like, well, yeah, you can do those high kicks, but you're taller than everybody you're sparring against. <laughs> so you're actually kicking down, you're twisting your knee and, and hip in a funny way that isn't really efficient. And you're certainly not kicking above your own head. So again, um, my advice to anyone when they see any claim on online, even from me, question everything. Ask mm. why, you know, what do you mean by that? You know, things like that. So, um, and, you know, there's been a lot of research done into dynamic stretching, which has shown improvements in muscle performance because of post-activation potentiation, which is just a really fancy term of saying, warming up the nervous system to mm. contract harder and faster. Um, so most studies show a an improvement some studies show no change but i i can't think of a study which has shown a a decrease in performance following dynamic stretching so that's if you, if you want to be really safe to stick to dynamic stretching in the warm-up yeah so the short answer is it depends <laughs> right it really does it depends, yeah. that's but it would be a very short podcast if i just said yeah. it depends <laughs> that's right yeah. i appreciate that <laughs> and yeah. context as well i think People, exactly what you said people are forgetting about why why exactly they're doing something and and you know with the stretching before say a long run or a sprint or you know your sports it is about doing what's going to I guess then replicate what you're doing out there so <laughs> if you're sitting in a static stretch for three minutes it doesn't exactly replicate what you're about to do so yeah questions yeah. and context absolutely absolutely the last um when it comes to the research the last five years have been really really good for looking at stretching and warm-ups and what we found there's a great study in 2016 and kind of all the evidence since then with has, has supported this has shown that if you need to do static stretching or you want to do static stretching in your warm-up but you're worried about potential negative effects on performance. If you hold the stretch for 60 seconds or less per muscle group and then do some dynamic stretching afterwards, there is no reduction in muscle performance. So if Boom, you, want, you, if you heard want to, it here first. Yeah. Or maybe <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some people will be hearing this first here. So and yeah, you know, just get absolutely. the message out. So if you need or want to, because some people get a great psychological benefit from it, you know, it helps them prepare. But if you, like I say, if you're worried about potentially reducing strength or, or anything like that in the main part of your workout or sport, 60 seconds per muscle group, that could be holding the stretch for 60 seconds or 30 seconds one side, 30 seconds on the other, and re repeat. And then do some dynamic movements, which are based upon what you're about to do. So if we take a squat, for example, you could do a frog stretch, uh, which is just when you're, you're on your knees and just trying to slide the, the knees apart. 30 seconds on. 30 seconds off, 30 seconds back on, then do some squats to warm up. That's perfect. You're not going to get any reduction in muscle performance. Um, yeah. So that, that was a great finding. It yeah, really was. brilliant. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about some terms that people mm -hmm. throw about. Yes. Passive range, active range, mm -hmm. mobility, and obviously mm -hmm. flexibility. And yeah. I feel like these words get used interchangeably. <laughs> yeah what's yeah tell us more about these terms yeah. how we should be using them <laughs> most importantly yeah. so I'll, I'll i'll preface this by saying you can use the terms however you want i'm not here to be uh, a vocabulary nazi or anything like that all i do is tell people what they mean in the literature the scientific literature so you know what people are talking about when you're reading a research paper right that's the main reason why mm. why i say that <clears throat> and i always say we should be led by the the vocabulary used in the literature because it's very very consistent very consistent um you know you'll in the on social media you'll have someone saying passive range and somebody will say 
you know, something mobility. They, they, the two completely different terms, which mean the same thing, but you take a hundred research papers and 99 out of a hundred will use the exact same terms. Um, so it's very reliable. So, okay. So flexibility is just the ability to change the position of your joints. Okay. I.e. it's your ability to move. Um, and flexibility is the preferable term over mobility because because people say well mobility is moving as well flexibility literally means the ability to change that's one of the main definitions of it so if you've got mental flexibility you can change your mind about something if you've got uh, emotional flexibility you can change your emotional regulation physical flexibility is just the ability to change the, the position of your body and if we think about how flexibility is measured it's measured by range of motion that word motion is very important because in, in biomechanics and physics, for about 400 years now, that word has meant to change position, right? So when we say range of motion, it means the amount that something has changed position in the context of the body. It's how much a joint has changed position. So if you take your knee from uh, full flexion to full extension, we say it's changed by a certain amount of range of motion. We're saying it's changed from this position to this position. It makes sense to use the word flexibility because it means the ability to change, right? And this is why it's used. Flexibility is, is, is defined as a joint's range of motion. Um, sometimes people define it as the, the amount tissues can stretch, but that is a component of flexibility called extensibility. So that's how far tissues can lengthen. So extensibility is related to flexibility, but it's not flexibility. Flexibility is a motor quality. It's an ability. It's, it's something that you have. Like you have strength, right? Strength is your ability to produce a certain amount of force. Uh, flexibility is exactly the same. It's like a fitness attribute, if you will, um, rather than just how stretchy your tissues are. Um, with flexibility, there are different types of flexibility depending upon the circumstances. It's very easy to understand what the differences are because your body can only really, or your musculoskeletal system, can only do one of two things. It can move or not move, and it can contract or relax. So your joints are either moving or they're not moving, and your muscles are contracting or they're not contracting. So if it's moving, it's dynamic, and if it's not moving, it's static. And there's, there's specific reasons why we use those terms from biomechanics, because it has to do with acceleration, but I'll, I'll not go into that here. Um, and if the muscles are contracting, it's active. If they're not contracting, it's passive. Now, those two states, moving and not moving and, and contracting or relaxing never occur independently. You're either moving or not moving and contracting or not contracting. So it, we can think there's, there's four different types of flexibility there, but they actually come together. Still four types, but it's just a bit more in depth. So if your joints are not moving and not con your muscles are not contracting, it's static passive. That's just relaxed stretching, right? You you sit in a split and you're not contracting the adductors if you're in a middle split. That's a static passive stretch. Um, if you are contracting the muscles, but the joints are not moving, it's static active. So think about doing a middle split between two chairs. The, the adductors are contracting to hold you up. Static active. If the joint's moving and the muscles are contracting, like any voluntary movement, it's dynamic active. And if you're lying on a table and a physical therapist is, is moving your joint so it's moving, but you're not controlling the movement. Muscles are completely passive, dynamic passive. That is it. There's nothing else to it. So there's four types. For practical reasons, the three main ones we focus on are, are static active, static passive, and dynamic active. Um, because people have, haven't fully grasped the fact that those two, th those two states are not independent of each other, so they, they tend to think we're either moving or not moving, or we're we're contracting or not contracting, they'll tend to think like dynamic stretching is different from active stretching, but they're, they're actually not, they, they, they come together. So this is why you can see people talk about dynamic range and then active range and then passive range and then static range. It's like, well, no, you have, you have a range of motion and you can be dynamic and, and, or static through it, and you can be active or passive through it. So your joints only have one range of motion. The words we use like passive, active, dynamic, static, just describe what's going on within that range. That makes sense. Does that you following so far? Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> my brain is like oh, slow down <laughs> I think so so when our so we can take our joint mm-hmm. well okay I'm a massage therapist and I take someone's mm-hmm. arm through their passive dynamic range which is means I'm moving it and they're not doing they're relaxing dynamic passive there you yeah. go yeah yeah <laughs> And so I can move, let's just say I can move their arm at a certain, it goes behind, up over their head Mm -hmm. and behind their ear. Yes. And then we take it down and then Mm -hmm. they go ahead and do it, but they can't take it that far. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is why we need to differentiate. Yeah. Yeah. So the most range of motion that you can ever show will always be under static passive conditions. So uh, holding a position without contracting the muscles because of the, how the nervous system works and the biomechanical nature of tissues. The slower you move, the less the tissues resist against you and also the less the nervous system is likely to fire up and apply the brakes. And um, uh, also when you, are, when you take the tissues to a certain length, you get to a point where those tissues can't contract anymore because there's not enough sarcomere overlap. So you can always take them to a point where it will always be passive. So static passive is basically your maximum level of flexibility or range of motion. But the things we do within that range will affect how much range we can show or how much of that range we can show. So like you say, when you are doing a dynamic passive movement, often called a mobilization, like you take the the patient's arm or the client's arm above their head, those antagonist tissues are not resisting against that movement because it feels safe. It's not having, there's no demand on the system. It's not having to control it. You ask them to do it themselves, then the nervous system comes online and it has to, you know, the stretch reflex plays a part, agonist, antagonist, co-contraction plays a part. And also psychological factors like fear. A person may not be able to raise their arm overhead simply because their nervous system doesn't feel it's safe for them. And so it will apply the brakes so to speak, to stop that movement, even though you've just proven to the nervous system, the arm can go all the way there. This is why we need to differentiate between the types of flexibility and therefore the types of stretching, because there are different responses and different outcomes based on the things we're doing. So if all you're doing is dynamic active stretching, you can't very effectively improve your static passive range, which is your total potential range of motion. Um, sorry, you can't improve your your static passive range by doing dynamic active movements. You basically have to improve your static range and then build your dynamic skill within those within that static range. But you get people who will do these dynamic flows or these mobilizations, as they call them. I'll get onto mobility in a minute because it's a fun topic of mine. Um, thinking you're going to improve your range of motion. It's like, well, you can only improve your dynamic range within the limit of your static range or your static passive range. So if you want to improve your total potential amount of movement at the joints, you have to work on your static passive flexibility, you know? Um, so this is why we need stretching basically, because if you're, you're moving, your body will allow you to have that range of motion while you're moving. But if you're not doing anything to extend the limit, the static passive limit, you, you're going to hit a barrier, and not be able to move, move much further. Um, but yeah. Mobility is a very interesting word. Um, it basically means just to move. And when you go into the, into the research literature, it basically means having a mobile base of support. So it means being able to walk, right? Being able to walk unassisted without injury and without excessive use of energy. And so this is why things like a wheelchair or a walking stick or a walking cane are called mobility aids because it's your ability to go from point A to point B through three-dimensional space or get up out out of a chair walk to the to the kitchen and and make yourself a cup of coffee however people have taken that word and applied it to dynamic active flexibility and so that's become interchangeable with dynamic active flexibility and i think it was done with the best of intentions i think they were trying to simplify things for the general for the general public Um, what they've done however because there's only two words mobility and flexibility they've 
reduced range of motion to just active and passive. They say mobility is active range of motion. Flexibility is passive range of motion. I mean, that argument falls apart when you say to them, well, what about the 10 plus thousand studies in dynamic flexibility, right? Like you're just going to ignore all that research on dynamic flexibility, which is an active type of flexibility, right? Um, and so the problem we get now is it, that model's become very popular because it's very easy to understand. But then you say to them, well, what about speed of motion? Speed of motion is very important because if you're just de defining range of motion as active or mobility and passive or flexibility, you, you can't have a discussion around velocity, right? Or how quickly you're moving. You can when you talk about static versus passive, uh, sorry, static versus dynamic, but not active versus passive. The words active and passive just mean to contract or relax. That's what they mean. So what you're saying when you say mobility and, and flexibility in that context is mobility is your ability to contract your muscles in your range of motion. And flexibility is just being able to relax in that position. There's no discussion around speed of motion, which is very important because dynamic flexibility is velocity dependent. But flexibility is speed specific. So if you want to be able to do high kicks in a martial art, you have to stretch at speed by doing those high kicks at a speed. It has to be about 75% of the speed you want to move at. So if you want to squat at speed, you have to stretch at speed. You have to build up the speed over time. But if your model of teaching your mobility versus flexibility doesn't talk about velocity, it's an incomplete model, you see, and it's not a very useful teaching tool. We're starting to see the change now. Um, there's a very popular group who use this model and they've started now to talk about dynamic and static well i think they call it dynamic and static loading um, and they've started talking about velocity so we are starting to see the change but for a long time people had split range of motion into just mobility and flexibility active versus passive but there was no discussion around the speed of motion and that's so important because unless you think about how fast you're moving and train to build up that speed over time your dynamic stretch reflex will kick in and fight against you your tissues there's something called strain rate sensitivity which is the faster you stretch the more your tissues resist against you um so but you can condition the tissues and condition the nervous system over time by progressively increasing the speed of motion but if you don't talk about velocity you can't do that so training becomes ineffective uh, so it started with the best of intentions but mobility has nothing to do with range of motion at all uh, I mean, it does now because people use it to talk about being able to move in their dynamic flexibility. So it's really just a synonym for dynamic active yeah. flexibility. But it's it that word doesn't mean what people think it means. Um, yeah, it just means being able to move. It's, it originally had nothing to do with range of motion and doesn't in most of the literature in, in, in the scientific literature. It really doesn't. But uh, yeah, it's funny. It's almost like it's a great thing and, and then not a great thing because I mean, it's great because it's actually they've unknowingly brought stretching and flexibility mm. to the forefront and giving it the, you know, the kudos it deserves. But then mm. it's also kind of taking it away because people think that mobility is separate <laughs> to flexibility. This is the problem. This is a problem. The issue with this, this mobility, and like I say, people can use whatever words they want to use. The problem with this mobility versus, and it's always mobility versus flexibility. Yeah. It's like, why is it this like false dichotomy, either or black and white look and things? Is it creates this air of superiority around mobility training versus flexibility training. But it, it goes back to what I said about how static passive flexibility is your ultimate limit of motion. So if, if you've got this air of superiority around mobility versus flexibility, and all you're doing is, you know, dynamic active stretching, which is what mobility work is, you're not going to be able, there's a limit to how far you can move your joints. At some point, you're going to have to work on the passive stuff, the flex, the, the, you know, the flexibility work. But because flexibility is, is painted in such a negative light, people move away from it. And so we see things like, you know, people who are just lifting weight to improve their flexibility end up increasing tissue stiffness because of increases in cross-sectional area, collagen content, things like that. And so what's often reported by people who do just mobility training, the active work is they say, oh, do you know what? I got this range of motion. And then three months down the line, it became really difficult to access that range of motion. That's because tissue stiffness increased because of solely doing active inputs. So you need to do the passive work to offset that increase in tissue stiffness, which 
occurs as we age naturally anyway. So if you're a middle-aged person who's just doing active work, you're fighting against the increase in, in tissue stiffness caused by your training inputs, but also the age-related increase in tissue stiffness. So you need passive work. You really do. Um, but yeah, it's such a silly, silly model. It really is. It's such a silly argument, like, you know, mobility versus yeah, flexibility. Exactly. It's like, oh. and the reason it was, it, it's purely marketing, purely for marketing, marketing reasons why they did this. It's to create an air of superiority around this particular method or this book or this brand. You know, we do mobility, they do flexibility, therefore we're better. It's like, well, actually, no, you're, you're ignoring 50% of the research literature. So you can't really call yourself science-based and you're also not talking about velocity and you don't really understand what flexibility is. <laughs> you know you're really, you're really just offering a limited uh flexibility training package yeah. it's like we don't do mobility if you if you you know read things as they actually were it's you don't do mobility training you just offer limited flexibility training that's, that's right <laughs> but like I, I you know some people like the word mobility right to them that's the mm. word they like to use use it it's fine just understand that there are flaws with that model and that flexibility is not just passive right and it's not just active and passive. It's also dynamic and static as well, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. Oh, huge. Well, let's talk more about static passive flexibility. Seems though mm -hmm. that's where and what we need to start with to increase our dynamic flexibility. That's right. Yeah, right. yeah. You're getting it. You see? <laughs> getting it. Um, so let's talk. Let's use the squat, for example, okay. you, since you brought it up. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, what do, what do we need to be doing to then increase, you know, our squat load? So whether we're improving um, the squat or anything else, flexibility is speed, joint, and position specific. So we get better at doing the thing we're trying to improve by doing the thing, basically. So if you want to get better at squatting, do the squat. Um, so with the squat, once you get to your lowest point, it essentially becomes a static passive stretch. There will be some activation of like the, uh, the lumbar region, the ankles and so on and so forth. But if you, for example, do a box squat and you sit on a box and you feel that stretch in your inner thighs, your, you know, uh, uh, your glute muscles, that's a static passive stretch. And so having an adjustable platform, whether it's gymnastic mats or like an aerobic box that you can lower um, and, and, and sit lower and lower into that squat is a great way to develop static passive flexibility. You can develop it to an extent with doing loaded squats itself or doing a loaded, a loaded squat itself. So every set or every other set, try and increase the depth of the squat. Bearing in mind, you can't, necessarily improve squat strength and uh squat flexibility uniformly because uh there comes a point where you're using so much uh load that the you will lose range of motion simply because the uh the demand on the demand for stability on the joints will cause the nervous system to recruit tension from the surrounding muscles so they tense up and therefore you lose range of motion um and this is why you see uh, when people squat a certain amount of weight, uh, after a while, they, it gets shallower and shallower, you know. Um, I mean, the squat itself isn't necessarily a position that requires a lot of work. You could have an ass to grass squat within two months, really. So uh, if, if squat depth is your thing, like you, you, you really want to get a deep squat, then I wouldn't worry so much about the amount of weight on the bar just use the weight on the bar as a tool to increase the depth of the squat during your loaded stretching, mm. right? Or your dynamic active work. Um, and it's great because it transitions from a dynamic active to a static active uh, movement when you have weight on the bar, because um, you say so you lower yourself down with the bar on your shoulders or front squat, whatever you're doing, you hold that position. You can hold isometric contractions in those target muscles for five to 10 seconds, try and relax and then lower a bit further. But like I say, there comes a point where uh, you are lower to the point it becomes a completely passive movement um, and, and using a box to guide the movement would be, would be very good at that. Um, but ideally, you'd, you'd use all types of stretching to improve any kind of movement. You use static passive stretching. You'd use static active, which is really isometric or PNF stretching. 
right? Where you're contracting and relaxing the stretch muscles and then dynamic active, which is just moving. And that can be with load or without load. So anything you want to improve, do that thing to improve it. So if it's a squat, if it's a deadlift and you just progressively try to push the range, I wouldn't say every repetition, um, it's easier to monitor it every set or even every other set. Uh, and then assume that position under static passive conditions to make it uh, a static passive stretch. If you're finding it difficult to stretch in the squat, then uh, you can keep the joints in the same position, but do it in, in, in a slightly different body position, like, the, like a frog stretch, for example, where you've still got that kind of same squatting profile with the lower body, but you're on the floor face down instead of standing up that makes sense oh ah, yeah. you, you basically answered my next question but okay. i'll ask it anyway just in case so you're yes. saying get into the position that you want to be doing or <clears throat> that you're gonna um, load up in what mm-hmm. if what what if we're not very good at that position mm-hmm. um and you know they can't get past 90 degrees in a squat because of maybe Mm -hmm. it's their ankles or you know whatever it is so then and but you know sitting in that position without weight Mm -hmm. is kind of easy but and you're not quite getting the the stretch so how do we work with that Mm -hmm. yeah so if um other other joints are are the limiting factor then you may need to isolate those joints the the ankle is is a perfect example uh, a lot of people lack ankle dorsiflexion, which can limit squat depth. So you may need to uh, isolate that joint with, say, some ankle pre-stretching before you do the squat, which is absolutely fine. Um, but even then, there are ways to stretch the ankles in the squat. So you could be in a squat position and you place a loaded bar across uh, across the thighs uh, towards the knees, and that will push the knees forward and stretch the ankles. So you're still getting a stretch of the ankles in that joint. Um, however, we do have to think, well, what if the person can't do that? The, the joints can't tolerate it. They just don't like it, right? Some people, you can have the most effective stretch or, or movement in the world, but if somebody doesn't like it, there's going to be very low uh, compliance and therefore it, it's not going to work. So that's when you could keep the joints in the same position, but change the position of the body. So this is where you could then do, say, uh, frog stretches or butterfly groin stretches or isolated hamstring stretches ideally you'd have them in as close to the position you're trying to improve as possible because the the more you deviate from that the less of the, the less transference there's going to be mm. so the less that is going to carry over into the actual movement itself um, but if they have ankle issues then just doing the knee to wall stretch you know you, you have your toes four to six inches from the wall and you just try and move your knee towards the wall you feel that stretch in in the uh posterior lower leg compartment mostly soleus but also you know fascia and all other stuff as well um but yeah you know to determine what is the best thing to do to improve flexibility you have to look at the thing you're trying to improve and then base your training inputs upon that right so if you are a runner for example it makes little sense to be doing middle split stretches because you, the profile of movement during running doesn't have this hip, this, this massive amount of hip abduction. Whereas if you're a gymnast or a martial artist, you know, yeah, you're going to need the splits. So first answer the question, what is it you want to do? Then answer the question, what is involved in the thing you're trying to do? What's happening at the joints? How is what position is the body in relative to the ground? So we can determine the vector of gravity. What speed is the movement performed at? Right. Um, so if you uh, are a martial artist and you do very fast kicks, you have to do very fast dynamic stretches uh, with like uh, leg raises, things like that. And that's really what uh, determining what you have to do boils down to is you know, what do you want to do what does it involve and and what what's the profile of the joints the position and, and and the speed and that that's it really it doesn't get more complicated than that <laughs> and and the more specific you can be to what you're trying to improve or the closer you can get what you're doing to what you're trying to improve the the more effective and efficient your training is going to be okay well let's go back to the runner for a second 
Okay. What 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 are they stretching? Because it's it's not like you're taking or they're taking their joints through mm -hmm. incredible range. It's very repetitive. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, yeah. there's more force going through the joints because they're running. Um, yeah. So how do we, um, yeah, determine what stretches they should be doing? The question is, should they be doing any stretches at all? Um, because with running, as you say, they're not moving through maximal range of motion. Their running is essentially their flexibility training. They're maintaining that joint range of motion with their running stride, as long as they don't get so fatigued that their flexibility reduces, which is something that can happen with fatigue. So you can, you can maintain that, you know, average flexibility just by doing your running, right? So the, the question is, do you even need to stretch? Because if you're doing long distance, like half a full marathon, we have to ask the question, is there going to be any effect carried over throughout that full event from the, from the pre-stretching? So say you do some dynamic or static stretches, uh, you know, during your warm-up, by mile two or three, the effect is probably gone, right? So uh, do, do a thorough warm-up to get your tissues compliant and pliable, you know, the system online, and then go for a run. If you're worried about... Um, potentially pulling something then you can start your uh, your your run with a slightly shorter stride length and then increase the stride length through the through the activity or through the run uh, so like the first 10 minutes it's just a nice shallow uh, stride length and then you increase the reach with your feet as you as you go along and that way you're going to be well prepared for that um, with things like running um, the benefit of stretching doesn't really come from the improvement in flexibility. It comes from changes to the biomechanical properties of tissues. Um, so with, with runners, the benefit of stretching and flexibility comes not necessarily from the range of motion, but from how it changes the biomechanical properties of tissues. So we know that doing static passive stretching over a long period of time changes the compliance of the tissues, which means they can store more uh, potential energy which makes running more efficient because we're having to use less active uh, processes to create energy so there's less chemical energy being used therefore there's a lower metabolic cost it makes running more efficient so you don't cramp up as soon you can go for longer so it's for a marathon runner i wouldn't say stretching the the calf muscles before the run is necessary necessarily beneficial i would say stretching the calf muscles over eight to 12 weeks is beneficial because it makes those tissues more compliant. They can therefore store more potential energy, which can then be used during the stretch shortening cycle. Uh, and therefore you're having to use less chemical energy. And so for, therefore there's less chemical damage occurring. And so you're, you can go for longer using less energy. That makes sense. Uh, thank goodness. Because for a second there, I was worried. I've been telling my runners. <laughs> <laughs> the stretching is good for them and you've just said that no, you don't need to but um i <laughs> understand in terms of, actually that was was going to be the next question because people or runners in particular say that you know if i stretch too much i don't want to get too flexible and lose the mm. um that rebounding effect that recoil in the mm. calves and and the achilles yeah um well this is the thing people have to understand so um in order to use uh, energy efficiently, we need stiff tendons. But there's a difference between muscle stiffness and tendon stiffness, right? Even though they're part of the same thing, the stiffness profiles are very different. So, um, you, you know, in order to have the range, you need to have compliant muscles so they can stretch. But in order to transfer energy efficiently to the bones, in order to move the joints, you need stiff tendons. And if you combine passive stretching, static passive stretching, with loaded cyclical movements, aka running, you can get compliant muscles and uh, stiff tendons. Right? It doesn't have to be one or the other. So if you do your if you do do your running quite regularly, but you also do regular passive stretching, you've got nothing to worry about. Uh, really, you really don't. Those tendons will take care of themselves. Yeah. Um, tendons really don't respond that much to passive stretching they they don't most of the changes occur within the uh 
uh, within the muscle belly, specifically the fascia or the connective tissue elements within the muscle. That's where the stiffness changes. Um, when you run, you make those tendons, those tendons, those tendons stiffer. And so the muscles are compliant so they can absorb more potential energy and the tendons are stiffer so they can transmit that energy to, uh, to the bones much more effectively. But it, it's funny, you know, it, when people say that I'm worried about stretching in case I become too flexible, it's like that old saying, I don't want to lift weights in case I become too bulky. It's like, yeah. do you know how much hard work it takes to become <laughs> exactly. flexible? Right. If, if you're going to stretch once and then become like Gumby, right. It just, <laughs> it, everybody will be super flexible. That's not how it works, man. It's not how it works. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> oh, awesome. So what about uh, those who are doing sort of field sports? Again, you've said, you know, stretch for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just take football, and I'm saying football, which is soccer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're on the same page. <clears throat> what would we be looking at in terms of stretching for that type of athlete, whether it's before a game mm -hmm. or during yeah. the week to improve. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just yeah. about to say mobility. <gasps> you can say mobility. <laughs> you can say, like I say, use whatever words you want. Just understand what those words actually yeah. mean. Um, so a football player. Um, so we just take a typical not not the goalkeeper but just like a yeah. midfielder or, or a striker or something we have to think about what they do right and, and it's best just to isolate each skill at a time so if we say that they're taking a the, the kick in the ball um say from a free kick or something like that or they're trying to get the ball upfield you have to look at the the profile of the leg joints and, and also relative to the upper body and so there's a a very uh extensive stretch of the hamstring of the loading leg, of the supporting leg, so the leg that's on the floor, uh, and also quite a, a large stretch of the hip flexor leg that goes back, you know, as it pre-stretches and then come forward and then, and then kick the ball. So we have to make sure that they have enough extensibility in those tissues that they're not going to be torn by the forces uh, involved in those movements. So having enough range of motion, enough static passive flexibility, in what is essentially approaching a front split position is very, very useful. It doesn't have to be a front split. It could just be like a, a long lunge, for example, um, would be, you know, very beneficial for that. Doing dynamic stretches, uh, you know, leg raises to the front, leg raises to the back uh, at the start of the training session is, is very beneficial. Uh, but also having strength in those positions too, because when you know, you plant your foot and the leg goes back and then the hamstring will contract, the hip flexor contracts to pull that, that foot forward to strike the ball. There's a lot of force being involved. And I think a lot of hamstring injuries occur in football because of the lack of extensibility, but also the lack of uh, mechanical strength in those tissues. And when we talk about strength and injury, a lot of people think it's the amount of weight you can move. It's, it's not volitional strength which is the strength or voluntary strength which is the the strength of your contractions and mechanical strength are two very different things mechanical strength is the amount of stress those tissues can take before they break and that's actually built through muscle endurance training not necessarily strength training right or traditional strength training yeah. um, so if you've got somebody who uh does say uh Romanian deadlifts and they do it with a very large amount of weight uh, and they do it for five to eight repetitions. Yeah. That's going to increase, you know, mechanical strength, also known as tissue tolerance, a certain amount, but what it's mostly going to do is improve your ability to contract those muscles, but the surrounding connective tissue structures, which are really what provide the, the ability to mitigate against injuries, they're strengthened best through doing high repetitions, low loads. So going on the, uh, the leg curl machine, for example, and doing sets of 25, you know, 50, even up to 100 against relatively low loads once or twice a week is going to have a much better effect than heavy strength training, uh, which a lot of people don't realize. Um, they, they tend to neglect mechanical strength of tissues. Um, also, doing isometric contractions in those stretches is going to be very, very beneficial too. Um, 
Yeah. That, and that, that allows you, obviously, to produce force to dissipate ground reaction forces, but also, uh, you know, ensure there is some, some tissue tolerance there as well, because that isometric contractions can help with that as well. So what are your thoughts on eccentric loading then, and especially oh, I love the it. hamstrings? Yeah, like the Nordic mm. curls there. Mm. I mean, that's what you see a lot of. Yeah, so the Nordic curls are a funny one because there's been a review just come out which says that all of these studies which have said it's it can reduce hamstring injuries by 50% are actually very poorly done studies. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the whole rehab world is up in arms at the minute. They're like, oh my God. What do we do? <laughs> yeah, it's funny because it's like there's this meme going around. It's like this grim reaper going to these doors and it's got, <laughs> I, I can't remember the first one was, but it was Nordic, Nordic curl was the second door and the door it was going to next was like the FIFA 11 which is like this this warm-up protocol used by football players which has been shown right. to reduce injuries and people are like oh no <laughs> it's, it's, you know yeah so um eccentric loading is fantastic for both flexibility tissue tolerance and uh maximal strength as well i think it's fantastic uh it has been shown to to in physically increase muscle length very efficiently we can increase muscle length with with passive stretching as well that's been well documented uh but eccentric uh, loading or eccentric stretching, whatever you want to call it, has the added benefit of increasing strength as well. And it will increase uh, tissue tolerance the, the same uh, as well. Maybe not the same as muscle endurance training, but it will increase tissue tolerance. Um, but yeah, I love eccentric loading. Um, the kind of method of stretching that I teach, if you're a complete beginner, you, you come in at, with static passive stretching, but you build up to loaded eccentric stretching. Uh, where you're spending like 15 seconds or more on that eccentric phase. I know most people spend about five seconds, but you, you get somebody doing an eccentric stretch for 15 seconds, they'll feel it. Yeah, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's phenomenal sweaty. for, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's hard work, but yeah. it's really hard work. But um, it, it's phenomenal for cold flexibility. And I think this is something that people need to be aware of is there's a difference in your flexibility from when you're cold and when you're warmed up. So cold is just the, the range of motion you can demonstrate any time of day without a warm up, right? And warm flexibility is obviously you're sweating and hot and tissues are more pliable. So that's why you have more flexibility when you're warm. But being able to access that range of motion when you're cold is a great indicator of your physical readiness to perform. Um, and so you're not relying on warm ups. Now, this isn't me saying never warm up. I'm saying even if when you have this cold flexibility, still warm up. But it shows that your tissues have all the compliance, the, the extensibility they need. You likely have all the strength you need because when you're stronger, your nervous system will allow you to access that range of motion without preparation. Um, yeah, so I think not just trying to develop the flexibility you need, but being able to develop it without a warm up is very, very important because all of the people I've seen who never get injured have that cold flexibility. You know? Oh, we got to talk more about cold flexibility then. <laughs> do, you, yeah. do you mean we we get that through eccentric loading? That's one of the ways we can develop it, but it's probably the fastest way to get it. Yeah. Um, so you could get cold flexibility just by doing static passive stretching, but it would take you 12 to 18 months to develop that cold flexibility whereas with eccentric loading you could get it in three to six months it's just a much faster way to develop that um yeah and because you you because you've done it with eccentric loading you know that the strength is there as well mm. the the maximal strength the the tissue strength is there as well so uh yeah absolutely i i, I think it's i think it's the best way to develop cold flexibility well, that kind of segues nicely into this next question because we're training the tissues, but in this sense, the nervous system as well, right, or our brain, because we got the we're essentially saying to the brain, we're okay because we've loaded it in this position before, so we got nothing now. We're cold. We're fine. I mean, yeah. So. I guess in terms of the the nervous system um, playing a part in flexibility, mm -hmm. should we be 
doing more of this eccentric stuff because it plays a part in our nervous system or is there a way that um you know adapting what I, what we do um that impacts the nervous system is important does that make sense did i just i think <laughs> murder that? I, I, I i think so I'll, I'll do my best to answer but if my answer <laughs> right. is completely wrong then just 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 correct me so everything we do in terms of stretching has some involvement with the nervous system so even when we do just passive stretching there is still uh nervous system input you know you can see what you're doing so there's visual input you've got uh, vestibular input and also the muscle spindles are still relaying information about the the stretch because there's there's two aspects to the stretch reflex there's a dynamic stretch reflex which is that initial tension you feel <clears throat> when you move and then there's the static stretch reflex now you, you can't differentiate when it goes from one to the other but when you hold a stretch that is the static stretch reflex acting um, so there's always involvement with the nervous system and we we can't choose to train either the tissues or the nervous system we're always training both but the greater the active stimulus the more involvement with the nervous system there's going to be so when we do something like eccentric loading there is a greater there's a greater amount of information going to the central nervous system and also a greater demand coming from the, the central nervous system such as a greater uh, neural drive which is the amount of information coming from the spinal cord to the to the motor nerves in, in the in the limbs um, and that just helps move things along a lot faster a lot lot faster um, and it helps to reinforce flexibility much better as well than just doing you know passive inputs so if you want to reach a, a particular range of motion faster and you want to be able to access it cold much quicker definitely do the eccentric loading simply because um, it's the greatest active input we can give the body because eccentric contractions are the most intense contractions we can have or that we can, we can use. And therefore the, the input to the nervous system is gonna be greater. So it's just really efficient. That's, that's yeah. why I like it. I always say training should be effective and efficient. So that means you're doing the things that work, but you're doing just what you need to do to get the training effect. You're not wasting, I hate wasting time training. Yeah. <laughs> um so yeah um <clears throat> eccentric like eccentric training is great because it, it has the greatest effect on the, the tissue structure but also the greatest effect on the nervous system as well but you have to build up to it you can't just jump into eccentric training because it's so demanding mm -hmm. it really is um and people have been hurt by just jumping into eccentric training they really have but also don't neglect the other stuff as well and you know, we have these different types of stretching, but you can actually combine them into one type of stretching if you wanted to. So you could do uh, a, a slow, so say we're doing a, a front split, right? And you're, you're slowly extending that front leg out in front of you. So you can spend 15 to 30 seconds on the eccentric phase. Once you've reached your limit, you can then hold that position for an isometric contraction, get all the benefits that come with that. And then you can have, say, yoga blocks next to you or chairs where you can put your weight on with your arms to take the weight off the tissues and then hold a passive stretch for one to two minutes if you wanted to and then come out of it so you get everything in one kind of movement you see but you have to build up to that and you have to know how to program it which is yeah. why having a coach is so so beneficial um yeah i love eccentric loading i think it's fantastic yeah, yeah. sensational you've you've kind of answered this and that the next question was um, is there a method to fast tracking <laughs> our flexibility, mm. which you just said, but if we can break that down a little bit more, the most common question I get asked is how long should I be holding a stretch? So mm. let's talk about, let's go beginner first. They're just getting into mm. their stretching. How often should they be stretching for how long of a session and then mm -hmm. each stretch itself yeah so again we we have to answer questions by asking questions right <laughs> and i guess the first question is how much time are they willing to devote to stretching and that gives you an, an idea of how much time you need to prescribe um research has shown that you can get flexible just by holding a uh, five minutes of stretching per week 
So uh, if you want more flexible hamstrings, you can stretch for a total of five minutes per week and you will see improvements. That doesn't mean you're going to get the front split or a, or a full uh, forward fold uh, pike stretch, I think it's called, in three months just by doing that, right? Um, the less time you spend stretching, the longer it takes to uh, reach your goal. But there is kind of a point of diminishing returns as well. The only real way to determine that is through trial and error, unfortunately. Um, but some things the research does help us with is that even though you can improve stretching by, you know, you could hold a stretch for 15 seconds and you might get a slight improvement in flexibility after a week or two, you're not going to see any change for holding for 15 seconds. 30 seconds is the absolute minimum I would say to people. But if somebody hasn't ever stretched or they haven't stretched for many years, your first few weeks aren't necessarily about building flexibility it's about building the habit so if somebody's new to stretching they find it uncomfortable it's, it's hard for them to maintain consistency just say to them look just hold a five second stretch on the hour every hour for six hours right and that gets them into the habit once they've developed that behavior you can then start look at things like intensity duration frequency so on and so forth um and once you're at that point, once the habit's been built, I would say minimum 30 seconds, ideally aiming for around two minutes. It doesn't have to be two minutes consistently or constantly, sorry. It can be four sets of 30 seconds. Um, bearing in mind that the more sets we break it up into, then the more intense the stretch has to be. So you can, you really have a choice here. You can have shorter, more intense sets, or you can have longer, more relaxed sets. Or if you're a masochist, you can have longer, more intense sets. You know, <laughs> if you've, and genuinely, if you have someone who can hold an intense, and we're talking seven or eight out of 10 here, you know, they, they like pain, seven or eight out of 10 for two minutes, they will get their splits very, very quickly. Um, but you have to be careful that people don't push their, their pain too far, right? Um, so I would say once the habit's built, minimum 30 seconds, look to accumulate two minutes in the position at least three days per week um ideally make it make this is just static passive stretching obviously uh ideally make the static passive habit daily because there's going to come a point usually around 60 years of age where you're going to have to increase the amount of work you do to maintain that flexibility so if you get somebody who starts at, at, at 20 and they start stretching at 20 years old their progress kind of looks like this the amount of work they have to do increases then they they hit you know what their, their splits for example then the amount of work goes down while they maintain it and it continues like this then they hit 50 60 70 years old and it goes like this right and it gets to the point where you're in your 60s and 70s you're having to stretch every day just because of the changes in the body that occur with age that we can't really fight off we can mitigate with regular activity um but tissue stiffness is is one of the big ones especially if you are male uh, because males have high levels of tissue stiffness anyway because of great cross-sectional area of, of, the, of the tissues. Uh, and then as we get older, uh, the body tends to take out elastin and replace that with collagen. Um, elastin are the fibers that allow you to extend. Collagen is the one that obviously doesn't like to stretch. So, But the more often that you stretch, the easier it is to, to fight against that. So I, I, I say to people, once you've you've reached your goal still stretch every day i think it's it's just a great habit to maintain because there's nothing worse than you've been stretching once a week for 10 years and that's you know you're happy with that and then suddenly you start losing flexibility and you start having to do more work again um so yeah i, I like to do it as a daily habit it's good for for the mind as well um yeah it's just a good practice to have i think but yeah start with start with 30 seconds build up to to at least two minutes um Anything beyond five minutes, I don't think is, is necessarily beneficial. Um, and yeah, try and do it at least three days a week, building up to six to seven uh, over time. For that beginner, mm -hmm. is it potentially, well, could they potentially get DOMS after stretching? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. And one of the things I, I, I do with every beginner is I have them just do passive stretching and then test their reaction to it before they do anything like isometrics or eccentrics because if you're getting doms 
you know, delayed onset muscle soreness, just from a passive stretch, imagine what an isometric stretch or an eccentric stretch is going to do. There's so much more force involved. And DOMS is a sign of tissue damage, right? Whether that's mechanical damage or chemical damage, we're still not 100% sure on, on what it is that causes the, the, the DOMS. But likely because you are taking the tissues beyond their normal resting length, that you are straining them to the point of, of micro rupture in some cases. Um, but yeah, absolutely. There was a great study done in, in it was 1993, but it still is valid today. It's by a, a team led by uh, it was Lee and colleagues. And they compared, the, the title compared static stretching with ballistic stretching. But when you look at it, they actually, they did dynamic stretching. It wasn't fast enough to be ballistic stretching. Uh, ballistic stretching is very fast, very vigorous, whereas this was just a controlled moving stretch. And both the dynamic stretching and the static stretching produced DOMS, but the static stretching produced greater levels of DOMS. So um, static stretching can actually be very intense for beginners. It can even be intense for experienced people too, because you may um, be able to do uh, a certain hamstring stretch to a certain level, and that's very easy for you. You can access it cold, but then you think, you know what, I want a little bit more flexibility. Then you take those tissues beyond what they're used to. It's a new, it's a novel stimulus. It's an unaccustomed load. Your body's going to go, I don't like this. Here's some soreness to, to reward you for <laughs> making me uncomfortable. So even, even experienced stretches can get soreness. But yeah, absolutely, you can get doms from stretching because it's it's a tensile force being applied to the tissues um and the consequence of dealing with that force is the buildup of mechanical stress the buildup of chemical stress and that will eventually give us uh, muscle soreness if it's significant mm. for sure yeah so beginners especially expect to be sore yeah um for sure I think that's so important to say because I feel like when people stretch and then they come back and they tell you they're sore, they, they feel like something's gone wrong because for some reason they think that you shouldn't <laughs> get sore after stretching. But it's the same thing as you exercise. When you're putting your tissues under a new stress or load, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. It's no different. Yeah, so exactly, really exactly. Yeah. Um, so I have this question and I'm not sure if there's any research around this. So obviously we have our muscles and our fascia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have our um, blood vessels and veins and then we have our nerves. <clears throat> and we've all heard, well, maybe we haven't, but nerves don't like to be stretched but we also have um our organs as well and mm -hmm. when someone comes in and says they have for example let's say tight hamstrings i mean do we know that it's the hamstrings like how do we differentiate what it actually is mm -hmm. because you know could it be the back and the nerves in the spine are being compressed and they just, um, that's what's stopping you from getting great hamstring length or, you know, the organs are all bound up in whichever, whichever way and, and not able to move. So folding forward <laughs> is hard to do. So the hamstrings stop you. So is there a way to determine whether it is actually the muscles themselves or whether it's something else that's playing a part in flexibility? Yeah. I think we can say we can use certain tools and tests to say it's a particular area. I think it's very difficult without medical imaging to say it's a particular structure like mm. the muscle or the fascia or the nerve. Um, and, and all we do really with that is we isolate the certain areas and perform certain stress tests to see what the reaction is. So you say a client comes to you and they try to, they're trying to touch their toes just because it's, a, you know, it's a valuable goal to them, which is fine. And they say, oh, I can't do it. I'm just so, I'm so, so tight and stiff, which isn't great because those are very vague words and humans aren't very good at differentiating between neurological tightness and mechanical stiffness. So you can then get them on a, like a massage couch and you can do straight leg raise test. You can do a hip flexion test with the knee bent. So you know that if you do the knee flexion test, they, sorry, the hip flexion test with a bent knee, 
and their their knee goes or you know touches their stomach it's not the glute max that's causing the uh the the issue because the hamstrings have been taken out of that equation then when you straighten the knee and then try to get the you know flex the hip again they get to like 90 degrees you know okay this is likely something along the posterior compartment of the thigh and possibly the lower leg could be muscular could be fascial could be nerves we we don't actually know so then you can go into things like um nerve provocation tests like the slump tests you know where they slump over and, and if it you know lights up then uh then it can potentially cause uh you know symptoms to appear yeah Regardless of what the thing is, I don't think it really changes what we do to get flexible. You know, you're still going to stretch those tissues. You're still going to apply load to those tissues. Um, very interesting point, actually, because you, you talked about nerves and how nerves don't like to be don't like to be stretched. Um, the the idea for a long time was that if we don't stretch nerves, or sorry, if we stretch nerves, that they essentially they break. But there was a study done the end of last year by a team led by Sandro Freitas, who's a very prominent researcher from Portugal and they looked at hamstring flexibility and they compared isolated nerve stretching which is like the slump test with specific hamstring stretching and they found that the nerve stretching improved flexibility better than the hamstring stretching and there were changes in nerve stiffness as well which means there is a mechanical response to, st to stretching yeah so we can actually stretch nerves so this idea that when we do like a front split, right, that we shouldn't be stretching the nerve, it's like the nerve is going to be stretched. Now we know from anatomy, from like, you know, dissection and things like that, that nerves do move through the territory that they innovate. But also there's going to be certain positions where they do get stretched. And we have to understand that when we talk about tensile strength of, of nerves from anatomy dissection, we're talking about dead tissues, basically very different to living tissue um but it was a it was a fantastic study um you know it's novel research that really answers the so what question you know you know what is the point of this well it's a whole new area of research that's going to start opening up but but nerves do respond uh, positively to stretching naturally we shouldn't be trying to trying to stretch the nerves too much because they are mostly connective tissue and connective tissue isn't great for stretching um but yeah, nerves can and do stretch and, and respond favorably in terms of stiffness. So, so nerves can actually change their extensibility to facilitate greater flexibility. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah, I know it's pretty, it blew, it blew my mind. I'm <laughs> yeah. going, I know Give me a minute here. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, so there are certain, to go back to the original, original question, there are certain things we can do to try and isolate the area of the body that is possibly responsible and even maybe the structure that being said if you do like a nerve provocation test like the slump test and there's no symptoms in the back in the low back that's not to say there's not some compression in the sciatic region for example which is causing that issue and it's it's very hard to differentiate but like i say it doesn't really change what we do mm -hmm. we just load those tissues uh, in a way that is tolerable to the individual doesn't cause uh, an aggravation of symptoms and they just progress that over time awesome let's talk surgery and scars mm -hmm. what do we need yeah. to know about scars when stretching um, and does mm -hmm. stretching actually become more important okay so when we're talking about scars we have to know a thing or two about the biomechanics of scar tissue so we know that scar tissue um, has a much greater reduced resistance to fatigue, uh, to failure, which basically means that a scar will break more easily at a given load compared to healthy tissue. There's this, I think this kind of misconception that the scar is very tough and fibrous and therefore it, it's, it's a lot, you know, a lot more robust than healthy tissue. It's not the case. Um, and that's one reason why a previous injury is the strongest indicator of future injury risk because if you've had a muscle tear there will always be some type of some level of scarring there and so if that hasn't been if that hasn't healed well or be, been rehabilitated optimally there's a chance it's going to cause an injury in the future because of that uh reduced resistance to failure um there's also um even at very low loads so very low amounts of stretch uh scar tissue isn't very compliant so it, it's very hard to stretch, but also if you stretch it too hard, it will break very easily. So it's a bit of a conundrum. 
And there's also, when you look at the microscopic st structure of a scar tissue, like the, the collagen fibrils, for example, there's an altered directionality. So collagen tends to be quite uniform along the lines of tension or the lines of stress, but a scar tissue is all places if it, if it hasn't healed well, I mean, uh, and that can, you know, uh, interfere with uh, regular movement and performance. Um, and so we have this, like you say, this conundrum of, okay, we need to stretch these tissues because they, they're limiting extensibility, but we can't stretch them, you know, too much or too far. So the you know, question is, what do we do? Um, so we know that if we load the connective tissues properly, then fibroblasts, which are these cells within the connective tissue, will um, change their, uh, matrix, their matrix remodeling activity. Uh, and so that the, the architecture of the scar tissue um, better responds to the demands that you're placing upon it. So it doesn't get rid of the scar tissue, but it makes it, it, it improves the situation basically. Um, and it, if we do things like eccentrics, isometrics, um, then it, uh, it stimulates those fibroblasts to reconstruct and rearrange the collagen in a way that interferes less with movement. Now, Will the scar tissue ever go away? Probably not. But can we get to a point where we, we don't even notice it most of the time? Yes, it depends upon the severity and location of the scar tissue. Um, so like I say, combining stretch with active uh, muscular contractions, so loaded dynamic movements, eccentrics, isometric contractions are very good strategies for dealing with scar tissue, for mm. sure. Um, <laughs> passive stretching isn't that great for it, unfortunately. Yeah. And so is this something that you'll have to continue to do forever because um, it's always there or once you've developed, uh, you know, that more fibroblasts have, you know, gone to the air and changed it, so to speak, that stays as is and that's you're kind of good or it's reached its level um, or, or do you have to continue to stretch to maintain it? I, yeah, I mean, I'd say you'd have to continue some work to maintain it because yeah. the body will adapt to what you, how you're using it, right? Yeah. So if you, if you do all this work to kind of resolve the scar tissue issue and then you go and sit on a couch for 40 years drinking beer and eating pizza, <laughs> then uh, it's, it, it's not going to be great for, for the scar tissue. <laughs> Unfortunately, no, I wish. I can imagine a program where you just sat on the couch watching, watching uh, Home and Away, eating, uh, you know, eating pizza that'd be amazing um yeah no uh you'd have to do some work i'd imagine but i i you know i get this question a lot actually you know people say oh, once i've been stretching and done this work do i have to keep doing it and i say you need to change that word you get to keep doing it right you need to embrace your ability to move and you know it's a privilege to be able to do these things because there are many people who can't do them um so yeah, you are going to have to do some work over time. Not as much, you know. Once you get to a point where you don't notice this, this scar tissue issue anymore, this, you know, pocket of tightness, you, chances are you're never going to notice it again. Um, but it's good just to do a little bit of work now and again, you know, a couple of times a month, I'd say. Yeah. Um, so it's not, it's not a massive investment of time, but it's, it's still worth doing. Uh, it should be enjoyable as well. Yeah. Sure. And so how much more difference can we make if, for example, you've had the surgery, like you, and you come out of it. How close to the incident or the surgery that you start working? Obviously, it's got to be healed. You're not going to be stretching on something that's um, going to be tearing and opening up. But um, how important is it to start early on? Oh, very important. Very important. Um, because the collagen restructuring process occurs almost immediately right um so ideally once the acute healing stage is out of the way and how long that lasts depends upon the 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 uh, preceding incident and also any surgery you've had mm -hmm. uh, you need to be loading and stretching that tissue as as soon as you can this is why in almost every rehab program stretching is a component or restoring range of motion is a component in the very early stages of rehab. So if you've had a low grade muscle tear, for example, which doesn't really require surgical intervention, I'd be stretching within two weeks, um, maybe, maybe even sooner, you know, 
Um, if it's the type of tear that requires surgical intervention, then you're going to need to wait until your stitches are out. Once those stitches are out and you've been given the all clear by your physician, start loading that thing, you know, with intolerable limits. And this is the thing following an injury. But people are very cautious about the amount of load that they use, whether it's a passive stretch or an active stretch. Discomfort is fine. Even a bit of pain is okay as long as symptoms don't exacerbate. Um, there's a great uh, physical therapist from Canada called Greg Lemann, and he has this fantastic saying called poke the pain. So what he's saying is in order to rehabilitate and get better, you have to poke into the pain, not jumping into it, but at yeah. least embracing discomfort and occasionally trying to push the envelope a bit and accepting that there's going to be a bit of pain. If it's too much, that's okay. Back off, you know, stay at the lower level for a bit and then try and go into it again. And it's only through that regular pushing the boundary that you're going to, you're going to make a substantial change to your situation. Um, otherwise, if you hold back for too long, not only is the tissue going to adapt in a way that it, uh, it shortens, it's going to be much harder to, to deal with. You've got this whole cascade of nervous system issues to deal with, like kinesiophobia, fear avoidance, um, catastrophization, where the tissue is perfectly fine, but you feel pain as though it's as though it's been torn open again yeah. um you know it's essentially pain that's in your head but it feels very 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 real um so you need to start that movement and loading process as soon as possible yeah for sure dan this has been sensational if people want to find out more about you and what you do how can they find you yeah, just uh, just go to flexibilityresearch.com or find me on Instagram. It's flexibility.research. Uh, that's where I'm active most of the time. Uh, I do have a YouTube channel, but I don't really upload much to it. Uh, but yeah, you can find me mostly on Instagram. That's where I am. Uh, I have a blog uh, as well at flexibilityresearch.com. So yeah, find me at those places. And do you have a course? I do, yeah. Um, I, I run. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, I run a course for, primarily for trainers or anyone interested in coaching flexibility. It's called the Master Flexibility Trainer Course. Uh, it's 16 weeks long, um, and it takes you from the very beginning of understanding what flexibility is, what the terminology means, all the way through understanding the biomechanics of tissues, the physiology of the nervous system, the different types of stretching, and also how to program stretching, uh, and also how to run that as a business, uh, given the situation with COVID, uh, I think the business of being a trainer and coach is very different to how it used to be. Mm -hmm. And so there are certain things you need to understand for how to run an online business versus an in-person business. Sure. Um, so yeah, it basically takes people and builds them from the ground up on how to be, uh, how to be a, a flexibility coach. Um, understanding that once you finish the 16 weeks, that's just the beginning, right? Um, you get all sorts of uh, you get like lifetime access to the course, but there's a forum that you get access to where there's articles and support calls, things like that. that uh, if they want more information, they can go to flexibilityresearch.com and hit the education tab. Um, next one opens up in, I think, January. I only run it three or four times a year to, to maintain quality of, of instruction. But yeah, it's, if you want to really know the science of flexibility and how to communicate that to clients, it's the course for you. Absolutely. Oh, Dan, this has been sensational. I've got one last question for you before uh, we head off. For those wanting to start a stretching program for themselves, mm -hmm. where do they start? Yeah. So this goes back to the kind of stuff we talked about earlier on, which is what do you want to do? What kind of things do you enjoy? If you are fairly sedentary and you just want to become active, just look for some sport or some class you want to take part in. Um, if you just want to get flexible for overall health, move around a little bit, find out where you are the most tense or the most tight and stiff, and then just hold that position for time. And over time, that position will open up. And then when you get a bit more confident, you can start contracting those muscles in the stretch position, relaxing, stretching a bit more, and you'll find flexibility will, will come to you with, with time and patience and effort. Um, but the best thing you can do is figure out what you want to do with your body and then try and replicate those positions or those movements and do them often and, and hold the end position for time as well. That's the, that's the basic starting block for everyone, I think. Yeah, brilliant. Dan, no thank you so much. More than welcome. Been a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Bye.